what happened? You mean in my case? Yeah. Well, in my case, they just slapped me with the fine. And I, had, I decided I was just going to pay it because at that time, um, there was no supporters. And I, it's sort of like going to jail when you're arrested in civil disobedience. You've got to be willing in the, you've got to be willing to say, my actions are governed by law. If you're going to punish me, like Martin Luther King was put in jail, I will go. I will go, uh, I will win later. Uh, like Gandhi, the idea of <clears throat> nonviolent resistance. So I said, okay, one day I, I will make these arguments and win. So. <coughs> so like you, there's a penalty to be paid. <coughs> and, and here I am, back in the fight. <laughs> I'm glad you are. Now, one of the, um, in my case that's coming up, uh, it's set for July 6th. Um, July 6th. Oh. <coughs> but Dexter is going to ask for a continuance because yeah. he said he was going to be out of the country uh -huh. you know, during that time period and he's going to see if we can get a continuance. But I am thinking, because we wanted you as a witness, but I'm also thinking how can we get you as a consultant with uh, with Dexter and Gary Zamber? Well, you can just retain me as an expert witness. I could be an expert witness. Did, did you hear about the Kali England trial? I was an expert there. I, I heard some of it, but not in detail. Oh, okay. Dexter called me at the trial as an expert witness and um, what's her name? Uh, is it Barbara Takase? Yes. She said, no, I don't, I'm not going to allow it, which is pretty extraordinary. You know, I came in all the way from Honolulu to Kilo at the expense of Kali England. And they never kind of say, you know, we won't hear you. It's a matter of right and courtesy. But then she went on and asked the prosecutor if the prosecutor was ready to proceed. And the prosecutor said, no, my, my witness, the officer who arrested Mr. England isn't here. And, and Judge Takase said, why not? Because he's attending the birth of their child. And she said, that's not a good reason. You should have known about that a long time ago. I dismiss. And so what, you know, that's something that usually you got a continuance on. An officer, a witness, attending the birth of a child, perhaps the first child. Well, you always get a continuance. What she was doing was saying, I don't want to listen to your jurisdiction arguments, but I'm going to let you off this time without prejudice so the government, if they want, can you know, bring this claim against you for taking rocks again, which they probably won't do because it's been such a long delay. But what's happening in the courts is they don't want to answer the question. They might let you off for some other reason, which is, I think, OK. Because if they say there's no jurisdiction, they would be basically blowing up their own world. That's right. It's That's a totalizing right. atomic uh, hydrogen bomb. So I think we're going to see more of that. It's like what happened with Don Lewis when he was on trial with Keanu. So if they do that for me. Yeah. How do we go about asking that it is uh, with prejudice? Well, and, and if um, and if they go and if they say if the judge says yes, what prevents me from going back into the house? Um, good question. With prejudice, without pre with prejudice means they can't bring an action against you again. The judge would have to. The judge hopefully would say the reason is you have a right to go into that house. Um, she might say, well, we don't find the elements of trespass there. And you would, what Dexter should do is question the, the judge, which element is missing? They failed to prove that this is not their house, his house. 
but they failed to prove that it's their house. If that's the case, bring a civil collateral action. Second, you sue them and say, um, I want to go back into my house. I have, you know, I've been dismissed from the trespass case. That's, that's collateral estoppel on the issue of, meaning you can't say anything that I don't own the house. Um, so it's a, it's a real, real step forward if you get that. So I just look at you. Yeah, okay. Then they've got three cameras here. Okay. by rolling. Aloha ahi ahi kako, and welcome to the Kanaka Express. My name is Kale Gumapak, your host for this evening, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Williamson Chang from the University of Hawaii, Manoa William S. Richardson School of Law, who's going to be my guest tonight. And I am very excited about having him on as my guest because it's been a while since we did talk last, and there's a lot of things that has uh, transpired since then and so it's really good to pick his brain tonight. Dr. Hey, Chang? My pleasure, Kale. Mahalo for joining me tonight. I, you Mahalo. brought some interesting books with you tonight. Yes, I did. And uh, if you would, you know, tell us about it. Well, these are um, three volume set of the memoirs of Lauren P. Thurston and Sanford Ballard Dole. It's called Memoirs of the Hawaii Revolution. And then I've been looking for this. Um, I found part of this in the archives of the state of Hawaii. It was a letter that was written by Lauren Thurston to um, a, a person named William Hopkins in Washington, D.C. In December of 1892, which is just a month before the overthrow, and that letter was, you know, some of it was clear, some of it was cloudy, some of it was gone. I tried to piece it together, and that was 20 years ago, and I just bought this on Amazon, and there was only two available, and the next one, the price went up, uh, it doubled, and as far as I know, there's only two of these in the state of Hawaii at the moment. One is in... Uh, Hamilton Library, um, Special Reserve, you have to have a lot of wow. permission to get it. Um, but I did find that letter, and to make a long story short, it was crystal clear here, and he wrote a letter in which he asked Mr. Hopkins to go talk to Secretary Foster of the United States about various things. In December of 1892, one of them was, can we just pay Lili Kalani to abdicate? Um, to sign the Treaty of Annexation. They asked a lot of, he asked a lot of questions, and this Hopkins person went to Secretary Foster, which we'd never have seen a record of, asked the question, and Secretary Foster answered and said something like, um, 250,000 <laughs> for Hawaii. Uh, sign, a, sign a Treaty of Annexation as Queen. And one of the things that I can't believe is Thorne, Lauren Thurston says, are you kidding? That's too much. Really? Uh, she gets 80000 already. We max is give her 100000 But there are other things, and I'm going to make it available, and I'm going to write about this, where he says, oh, the problems, ask the Sen uh, Secretary Foster, how are we going to get around the, uh, the problem with involuntary servitude or contract labor? Um, can we just buy off the uh, Hawaiians in the legislature? And if there's, there's never going to be a smoking gun where there's an authorization by the United States to go ahead with the overthrow. But this is the closest. So it, it sort of a, it goes to the point that the United States just didn't land Marines and help 
the annexationists. They knew about it in December of 1892. They were, they gave permission to John Lewis Stevenson to go ahead with the annexation. So we were overthrown by the United States. Not by annexationists, helped by the United States. That's what the apology resolution says. We were overthrown by the United States. Wow, wow. And Thurston um, was bold enough to include that letter in his memoirs. And I, I think he was kind of a, a, a brash, you know, kind arrogant. Of arrogant guy. He felt arrogant. like he was all justified. The other thing that I'm looking for in this volume is the Kuwait petitions in 1897. He went and checked every page of the petitions and came up with a report saying, this handwriting looks like this handwriting. This person is only eight years old. This Hawaiian is seven years old. And he tried to discredit the Kuwait petition. I mean, such a small mind. I mean, such a small person. He was trying to say, you can't look at this. And um, that's a part of the federal record. That's part of the record in the House on the joint resolution. So I just wanted to show, you know, that I'm still learning. And everyone says, uh, they say to us I see that. about uh, this, this history, oh, forget the past. It's not news. Well, one of the things that's really true, it is news. It's the future. It's new things that have brought to light the truth about the overthrow and the annexation. So uh, this is some of the things we and I have been doing for 20 years, is looking at documents very, very carefully, going back to the Library of Congress, and finding things that led me to what I've been saying on this show and elsewhere. So it really is new, and the landscape is changing, and that's what makes it uh, something we can say is history has not been settled. We are still learning. We're still, we're, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years, and well, it's empowered us. You know, since, since the last time uh, we talked, you know, I don't think I had you on the show when you, uh, after you sent a letter to uh, Attorney General, U.S. State Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, what has happened, you know, with okay. that? Where, where, where are we at with that? Um, uh, the U.S. Justice Department finally responded I think in December, it was a form letter. They started with the salutation, dear friend. <laughs> and they said, well, thank you for this letter. We're trying to find the appropriate department to put it, send it to. And that's all I've heard. Um, in other words, the Justice Department didn't respond to anything. They responded to the letter, and maybe it was carefully written because it says nothing. Um, but the critical point is they didn't rebut any, they didn't say in their letter, your reporting of war crimes is frivolous. Your reporting of war crimes has no basis, so don't worry about it. Uh, we're not occupying Hawaii. They could have said that. They're supposed to respond to these uh, requests. And their failure to say that is actually very important to Hawaiian people. Because this notion that was actually starting to run around the law school that Hawaiians could be violation, violation of war crimes as aiders and abettors or accessories after the fact. I get paid by the state accessor. Uh, I get paid by the state, for example. Um, we have a defense. We can say that, oh, um, the Attorney General doesn't even say that there are war crimes in Hawaii. So I don't have official, you know, I, I don't have official knowledge and awareness of that. If, you, if there were war crimes, he would have said so. He would have to prosecute. So it's still up in the air. So in a sense, it gives to, uh, I think, a lot of Hawaiians who are worried that by being part of the government of Hawaii or even paying their taxes, were they eaters and abettors or accessories after the fact, like OHA? They, they can at least be assured 
that they have kind of a defense as to whether it was clear that there are war crimes. I would like to ask you more questions on um, on OHA, but but first I I would like to uh, you know you you come out with all this information and you've also come out as a strong advocate you know in the um, in that there was an unlawful overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom there certainly was uh, yeah. and you have come out with a lot of uh, information and. You know, up at the university, you have your teaching classes as well as uh, being involved with, you know, other uh, colleagues and so forth. So, what what's been the uh, response since you've come out? Um, what has happened? Well, I think you're referring to a forum that was held at the university. I think it was November 13th. Um, it, at the law school in which the international law faculty was presenting sort of their version, their vision, and their opinions as to some of the things that I was teaching in my class and some of the things that Dr. Sai has written and, and an evaluation of the allegations of war crimes. Uh, fundamentally, they disagreed. Um, they started with the premise that, okay, we just know international law. We don't know the history of Hawaii and we're not students of Hawaiian history, so we're coming from an international law point, law point of view. And from that, uh, we assert that um, the occupation of Hawaii, uh, that's in doubt. Um, the United States probably has a treaty somewhere, there was consent, and there are no war crimes. So that was the other side. And it was done because there were concerns that the students didn't have the other side. I think the key is they were saying they were applying international law, weren't applying Hawaiian history or uh, United States law. I think the, the key thing is if you do this analysis without knowing Hawaiian history or without applying Hawaiian history, it's going to be an incomplete analysis. So. Um, there has been pushback, and that's to be expected. Um, sure. One of the things about uh, the university is it should be a place for the exchange of ideas. Um, I just started to write a response to that that I want to publish. Um, they didn't have the benefit of anything I've written. They had Dr. Sai's writings. Um, so I've written about first draft of an article that's going to be about 60 to 80 pages. Um, which explains my position on why the United States doesn't have jurisdiction or sovereignty over Hawaii. And we did that in one of your Kanaka Express shows, I think, months ago, July. Yeah. And so this is a, you know, my point is really a, a sort of a supplemental one to what Dr. Sai is saying about the continuity of the Kingdom of Hawaii. I'm saying that the United States even ex acknowledges that and acknowledges it in the Organic Act and in the Admissions Act. In the documents you have, um, number five, for example, is the Organic Act. It's right here. Yeah, you're looking at it. And the Organic Act uh, describes the territory acquired by the United States by the Joint Resolution as those islands acquired by the Joint Resolution. They don't describe it as you would expect to see in meets and bounds, or by longitude lines or latitude lines, or descriptions based on natural monuments from this mountain to that mountain, they simply say here, the islands acquired by the United States of America under an act of Congress entitled Joint Resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States, approved July 7th, 1898, shall be known as the Territory of Hawaii. Now, we know that the joint resolution has no power to acquire anything. So what they're doing is saying there's, we can't describe what we got by the joint resolution. Well, of course, because you didn't get anything. The best we can do in deceiving the people who look at this law is claim that the islands acquired by a joint resolution, which can't be any islands, are what constitutes your new territory. 
And so in this article I'm writing, um, I did a lot of research on the Statehood Act and its description of what's in the territory of Hawaii. And that would be right here on this one, that's the big one, that's this Admission, Admissions Act. Yeah, you've got it there. It's Section 2. Uh, Section 2 was the labor of a senator from New Mexico named Clinton Pre uh, Presba Anderson. He, at first, he, he was very, very angry at the people who brought the Constitution, the proposed Constitution of the State of Hawaii to this Congress in 1953 because he said, where's your definition of what's going to be in it? The only thing that was in the proposed state constitution was the language, Hawaii shall be what it's known to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he was angry. He said, show me the legal description. Like, I want to see what they did, uh, did with, like, Oregon, which says, from this political boundary to this mountain, to this ocean, to this sea, that what constitutes. <laughs> they couldn't say. And C. Niels Tavares, who represented the Hawaiian State Commission um, was was really in a uh, in a terrible position. He went and got gas station maps like Texaco no, and Exxon. Please, really? Yeah, <laughs> to try to show them. And the senators and congressmen laughed and said, "Come on, you got to be kidding." And so the best C. <laughs> Niels Tavares, Mr. Tavares, could do, who became a federal judge was say, okay, the Kingdom of Hawaii named its jurisdiction. When the provisional government supposedly overthrew the kingdom, they took whatever the kingdom had. And when the, when the Republic of Hawaii was created out of the provisional government, the Republic took, by constitution, whatever the provisional government had. And then he tried to say that the joint resolution in combination with the Constitution of the Republic <laughs> took from what the Republic had. But he can't say that because what he's doing is putting together two very different documents. One is a provision from the Constitution of the Republic of Hawaii and the other is a joint resolution. They can't be matched like an offer and acceptance. Why? Because Section 32 of the Constitution of the Republic of Hawaii simply says the President of the Republic of Hawaii, Sanford Dole, can make a treaty with the United States of political or commercial union. It doesn't say that we give it to you. You know, you're just saying you have the power to do so. And so the myth is that there is some kind of agreement, according to Tavares, with the uh, provisions in the Hawaii Republic Constitution and the Admissions Act. And the point I want to make is this description, some people would say, oh, that's a mistake. They, they obviously made a mistake. Well, you don't make a mistake when you define boundaries. What could be more important to a country than its boundaries? Than it's, yeah, absolutely. Because that's where your power, your military power, begins and ends. So countries uh, are very precise when they define the boundaries. Just look at the American Revolution when Great Britain defined the boundaries of the United States, and the United States agreed to that or the sale of Russia, it's so precise. Yet what we have here in Section 2 is no more better than what we had in Section 2 of the Organic Act. It names the uh, islands that are not in the state of Hawaii. Now, why would <laughs> you do that? Um, it throws out Palmyra, which was in the Kingdom of Hawaii, but it also throws out Midway, which is not in the state of Hawaii, Johnston, which never was in Hawaii, Sand Island off Johnston, which is never part of Hawaii, Kingman Reef, which is never part of Hawaii. In other words, why don't you add Manhattan Island while you're at it? <laughs> what they were doing. Or, Al or Alcatraz. Alcatraz. <laughs> what happened was this. Senator Anderson first thought this was a joke. It soon became clear that the problem was the joint resolution. The United States never acquired Hawaii in 1900 or 1898. He realized that personally. He moved to close the hearings and hold non-public hearings. The reason was he realized he was stuck. The United States had done something in 1898 that you can't do. 
claim a re resolution of Congress acquired foreign territory. Now, in 1950, he wanted to blurt out. There's a, there's a huge gap here, but he couldn't. He realized that the United States was in the middle of the Cold War with Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States was making a lot of hay from the fact that they accused the Soviet Union of violating the sovereignty of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, all Poland. In other words, our moral stance, our high moral ground was <laughs> we were the good guys. We don't intervene. We don't, um, we don't uh, derogate the sovereignty of other nations. So there's a letter in this uh, box of the papers of Senator Anderson which says, and it's from Thrusen Morton, it says, you've got to consider where we are in terms of our national security. And so he had to make up something, and he made this one up, and this one does no better than the descriptions in the Organic Act or made by the Constitutional Convention. It says, it says the same thing. The state of Hawaii consists of whatever uh, the joint resolution acquired. So here's how we would use this in your case. I would say to the prosecutor, this concerns a house on the Big Island. You prove to me that the Big Island of Hawaii was acquired by the joint resolution. How's he <laughs> gonna do that? There's no treaty of annexation. <laughs> the joint resolution failed. And I did this actually 15, 20 years ago. We brought a test case. And this is when I was working with Don Lewis and Keanu Sai. It was the test case of a foreclosure, like your case, on a house in Hawaii Kai. It was called Chung versus C or CPB, Central Pacific Bank versus Chung. And I raised the defense. I said, here's the uh, admissions act, the official description by law, by the United States law, as copied in the state constitution of what Hawaii is. It doesn't say the Big Island. It says Palmyra, it says Kingman, it says Midway. It doesn't say Oahu, it doesn't say Big Island. It says that what Hawaii consists of is our islands acquired by the joint resolution. You, the bank, as the moving party in this foreclosure, have the burden of proving Hawaii Island was acquired by a joint resolution. You know what happened? They were absolutely stumped. Four months later, four months later, they came back and said, Judge, if what Professor Chang says is true, then everything we've done in this courtroom <laughs> is void. <laughs> and I, I had talked this over with the client. I said, that's all we wanted to hear. Motion, uh, we, 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 we dismiss our motion to dismiss. In other words, the client was so good enough to let the foreclosure go through because the argument that I would make for you and I made for him blows up the world. The state of Hawaii doesn't have jurisdiction. The United States doesn't have jurisdiction over anything, everything, taxes, DLNR, everything. In other words, we were hoping that, and this was 15 years ago, that the seriousness of this defect, this flaw, this incredible flaw, would lead to negotiations between Hawaiians and the United States. Well, nothing happened, as you know. And we're back in the same box with your case. Yes. And other cases um, in which the well, issue of jurisdiction. Well, what happened, <coughs> you know, I know 15 years ago, uh, both you and uh, Keanu were making these unprecedented, you know, arguments. but. What happened to you when you did that? Well, that was the first one I brought. The second one, some Native Hawaiian clients came and asked me about this. And being a professor teaching in the area of Native Hawaiian rights, I felt it was my university responsibility to talk to them, and I talked to them. And they alleged and they claimed that Palmyra Island was part of the estate of one of their ancestors, and so that they had an interest in Palmyra Island. Well, um, I didn't take any fees for this, but 
I sort of made their case in public in a, in a news conference. And what happened was the owners of Palmyra Island sued the, my clients for slander of title. And what is slander of title? Slander of title is an argument or a cause of action where you say, you can't go around saying that title you have or I have doesn't belong to me. It's like a tort. It's like libel or slander. And so they sued us. And I was drawn into court. And the motion I made again was the motion I made in the Chung case, which was, and this time it was in federal court. I said, Your Honor, uh, you don't have jurisdiction. This is an in rem proceeding, meaning it's against the land. And how do you have jurisdiction? They have to prove, or you have to prove, Your Honor, that the island of Palmyra was acquired by the United States by the joint resolution. And here's the problem. They couldn't show that the island of Palmyra was acquired by the joint resolution. I did a lot of research on Palmyra, and you notice that Palmyra gets kicked out of the state, even though it was annexed by Kamehameha IV in 1862. It was part of the Hawaiian kingdom. Why should it get kicked out? It got kicked out because it was embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing to put into the state of Hawaii an island that's 990 miles south of Oahu. Not only is it embarrassing, it's problematic because another nation may say, hey, you're claiming Palmyra? We claim Palmyra too. You show your chain of title to Palmyra. <laughs> the United States couldn't show any chain of title. Why? Because the chain of title is broken at the moment of the joint resolution. And at that point, the court sanctioned me for making these arguments to the tune of the attorney's fees that had been run up by the other law firm to the tune of $70,000. So my salary got garnished for $70,000, and it was they finally got all their money a few years ago. So it's been a tough road. Back then, I didn't have like the support that we have today. Um, and you might ask, well, couldn't you have done something about it? Uh, perhaps, but I don't think that it was feasible. What, what was the reason for the sanction? I mean, the sanctions what, was what, what, I was making what, a frivolous argument. It's like what happened to Keanu in the perfect title case. What's happening to you? You're making a, what happened to um, a woman named Ruth Bolome who's claiming um, that there's there's a there's land in Kualoa that's being fought over between herself and uh, a corporation. She was threatened with sanctions um, this past two month, and Fokai Laianui went in as the attorney representing her, and I wrote into the brief that Pokai presented this argument, and Pokai was successful. He said, you know, things change, Your Honor. International law is, is relevant. It's not the same uh, scenario as maybe 100 years ago. And the judge didn't admit anything. He didn't say, oh, Hawaii is not part of the United States. They can't. But he did dismiss the sanctions charge against hmm. Ms. Bolome. So I wasn't so lucky. But in the tradition of civil disobedience, um, like Gandhi or Martin Luther King, you are challenging the law, but you obey the law until it's overthrown. And so if you, you know, I get punished as you got punished. We go. We go perhaps shackled, but we're not going to raise arms against them. So my penalty was sort of uh, out of the ballpark. Uh, I think the <laughs> judges wanted yeah. to make an example of me. But I, you know, like you, I'm saying that, yes, there is a law that I'll obey. But you're getting it wrong, Judge, and I'm going to show you later. I'll obey the idea of law. And that's what Socrates did when he was put yes. in, in to death. He said, he was offered the chance to escape. And he said, my dear Crito, um, if I escape, that would undermine everything I've said about the, the idea of law and my my faithfulness to the right law. In other words, 
you and I were taking the road of Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and Socrates, which is saying, uh, we're not going to take up arms. Uh, what we're going to do, we believe in the, the rule of law. You do not believe in the rule of law. You are being presented with laws of your own country, the United States, in the Admissions Act and the Organic Act. Why don't you follow them? You're obligated by your oath to the Constitution. It's not the law of the Kingdom of Hawaii we're talking about here. It is the law of the United States. It's not international law we're talking about. This was written by Congress, and my research in this article is going to show it was deliberate. They knew. They were presented in that year in which they, it took a year for them to write this, six drafts. Did they ever think about putting the names of the main islands in there? Yes. Um, an aide to, uh, to Mr. Tavares, Rhoda Lewis, who eventually becomes a Hawaii Supreme Court Justice, writes a note saying, just put in the names. Can't do it. Why not? Because if the United States claims Oahu and someone comes along from another country and says, prove it, they can't. <laughs> so this is actually consistent with the truth. Another way of looking at it is those who annexed Hawaii really did not think ahead to the consequences and the trail they would leave behind that could be discovered, you know, 122 later, years later. Well, in, in some of the um, information that I've read, you know, especially back in uh, during the time of uh, the necessity to take Hawaii as a result of the United States being at war with Spain, um, wouldn't you can wouldn't you say that it was um, in it was the arrogance of uh, the president of the United States at that time, as well as uh, the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. to say that we can do whatever we want to do. You're right. Um. Because in Congress, you know, there's on the record that there were congressmen and senators that were opposed to it and they were giving testimony, but yeah. yet, you know, their hands very, were forced. Very, very uh, correct. And indeed, if we go to the third page, um, excuse me, uh, this page, the one with the small hmm. print. Yeah, you got to go to the front of the. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. This is page six six three six from the congressional record, which is public, of the debate on July fourth over the joint resolution. And in reading it, uh, I'll just quote from Senator Allen. He says, "Mr. President, the Constitution must begin and end with the territorial jurisdiction of the United States." It cannot reach beyond the boundaries of our government. That's the third full yep, paragraph. I see it. it would be as lifeless and impotent as a piece of blank paper in Canada or in the Hawaiian Islands, and so with a statute or joint resolution. Now, that's just one quote of many. There was a filibuster, which is an attempt to block the passage of the joint resolution. So they delayed it, hoping that the president would drop this. You know what? killed the filibuster, they had no air conditioning. Washington, D.C. in summer is murder. So when it came to July 4th and right after, they just melted. But they made their points on the record, so here's evidence that the United States at least had senators saying, no, 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 a joint resolution cannot take the Hawaiian Islands. You can't say that was never raised. And how do you argue against it? Only two senators tried to make arguments against it on the record. One claimed that it was a treaty, a treaty, a, a treaty in which only one party needs to sign, which is crazy. <laughs> you know why he said that? He said the other party of Hawaii dies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he eventually, Senator Forker of Ohio, was to admit you can't take Hawaii by joint resolution. The other senator was from Nevada. His name was Stewart. 
He said, of course, we can pass a law or a resolution that says we take Hawaii. We can pass a law that says we uh, take 300 miles of Mexico if we want. And you know why it's valid? Because the president must enforce it. And somebody asks, you mean the president would have to go to war against Mexico? He says, yeah, that's what I mean. And he was asked, well, isn't that conquest, not treaty? He goes, ah, it's all the same. <laughs> so there were only two real attempts to justify the joint resolution. Everybody else, even those who voted for it later, were silent because they knew there was no argument. Wow. So the fact that there was no treaty means that there was no description of what they got from the Republic of Hawaii because it was a unilateral document, which means that the United States had nothing to put down on paper saying what it got. And so, so that's so why we don't have what, a what do you say to people, you know, today that says, well, you know, the United States has provided all this, these benefits to the islands of Hawaii as well as to the people today. You know, so just leave it. Oh, I would say, um, well, that's nice. <laughs> and we can talk about that. But first, let's talk about the legal status of Hawaii. Um, you have people whose rights of self-determination and rights in the international human rights law and the sovereignty of a nation which has been cruelly violated by the United States. Um, let's talk about that first. Let's talk about what the status of Hawaii is. Is it occupied in your mind? Do you agree that it's occupied? If it's occupied, why isn't there a military government applying the laws of occupation. One of them being you have to leave as soon as the military reason for occupation is over. Um, yeah, you, it's like the part of the joint resolution which the, where the United States says, we'll pay your national debt, $4 million. Well, how do they pay the national debt? To whom do they pay it? Sanford Dole? I'm not even sure there's a record of a payment. That's a benefit. But can all the benefits make up for the fact that there's a huge international wrong here? Let's ask the people who were harmed. Let's poll them. Do they forgive? It's easy to conquer or to take by joint resolution and later say, you know, you're better off this way. Or you're better off because Japan would have taken you uh, otherwise. Or or some power like that. That's not a relevant argument at this point in time. If there is law, and there is international law, on the presumption of continuity of a state, the Kingdom of Hawaii exists, and there's a law by the United States itself, you explain why you're not following the laws that you wrote that admit that Hawaii is not part of the United States or the state of Hawaii. Well, you know, within the last couple of days, you know, the internet has just been going viral with the Chinese announcing that they're ready to take over Hawaii and provide arms for Hawaiian Kingdom uh, activists. What, what's your views on that? Uh, my views are we shouldn't play that card. It's a dangerous card. I think the point that these um, generals in China are making is simply that the United States sending and military aid to the Republic of China would be like China arming Hawaiians. They're not saying they're going to do it. They're not saying, I don't, I, I think it's completely out of the question that they're saying that China is going to take over Hawaii. In fact, Saddam Hussein said, you know, your complaint how, uh, about my invasion of Kuwait, uh, how would you like me to complain about your invasion of Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people around the world are more knowledgeable uh, about the situation in Hawaii than many Americans, and even the American government. The thing that I took away from that is the, the the writer who picked up on this comment by the Chinese said, I didn't even know there was an independence movement in Hawaii. Our next move should be to educate the world. 
um, not to the independence movement, but to, it's not a movement, but to the fact that Hawaii still exists as a kingdom of Hawaii, and that the United States by its own laws acknowledges that it doesn't have jurisdiction or sovereignty over Hawaii. If they're here and they don't have jurisdiction, the logical conclusion is they occupy either under some form. Well, will this bring, uh, you know, the United States finally to move to uh, deoccupy the Chinese thing, Hawaiian Kingdom? Yeah, the Chinese. No, thing. I don't think they. I think the or, United or States more so that it's bringing light throughout the world of what the United States. I think it helps. I think it's um, the United States. If you if you notice. John Kerry got a letter, even though it got rescinded. He never responded. Uh, Attorney General Holder got a report from me. He never responded. Ken Osai asked uh, Assistant Secretary Esther Kiaina and Assistant to the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, I think it's Ruth Sue, to respond. And, and Ruth Sue said, yes, I will, to your argument. Nothing has been forthcoming. Why? Because they cannot do anything. Hawaii is a problem that is a totalizing problem. You're either completely here or you're not. And they cannot accept at this point the idea that they have no sovereignty or jurisdiction over Hawaii. And many people in Hawaii, particularly those who are not Native Hawaiian, simply cannot accept that either. It's confirmation bias. It's a term I learned from Dr. Sai, which is you look at the world through a lens in which confirms something you have a vested stake in. What I think um, must happen is we present these arguments. Um, we prevail in the convention that perhaps might take place, but we present these arguments every place we can, and we show the world something that the United States refuses to admit. And like 20 years ago, there has to be some action by the United States. Now, why aren't they taking action? It might be because the present president has a vested stake in the myth. If Hawaii was not part of the United States, as Keanu and Willie Kauai have pointed out, he wouldn't be a natural born citizen. So in other sure. words, there's a good reason why the present administration would do almost anything other than admit that it doesn't have, Hawaii is not part of the United States. They will go to federal recognition. They will offer, because the legacy of President Obama will be put into question. So, in fact, everything that's been happening in terms of the United States jurisdiction over Hawaii would be questionable. They don't know how to handle that. Well, with you know the uh, the research that you have uh, that you are doing uh, with what Lauren Thurston had done, as well as the research coming out uh, with Keanu, um, what would you know twenty years ago when you were arguing all of these cases, yeah. the two cases that that you had, um, it's certainly different today. It's certainly different. You know, so is it better? And oh, if, and, it's and, and if it is, light years why? Better. It's better because of the work Dr. Sai has done. He has, against all odds, persisted in presenting the truth, which is the presumption of continuity. Um, it's better because when we look at the Department of Interior hearings last summer, you had 90 to 98 percent of the people who made public testimony say the issue is, does the nation of Hawaii exist? The issue is no treaty, no annexation, no to federal recognition. That was not possible 20 years ago. People were still thinking Hawaii was part of the United States. The only wrong the United States had committed was an overthrow in which it merely helped the annexationists, not started. So this is a case of the power 
of education, of information, of social media, um, the power of staying with the course, of uh, Imua, of uh, doing what our ancestors uh, wanted us to do today, which we, we neglected for 120 years. We did not educate ourselves. The Queen knew that she couldn't use military force against the Marines because it would have led to retaliation by the United States and a claim of conquest. She set it up. So the only thing they could do was something which was impossible, take Hawaii by joint resolution. It would take 120 years before we would get it. Why? Because there was such effective propaganda, such effective denationalization, such effective uh, control of our education system. Where, When I was growing up, I believed the myth. It wasn't until I read this one passage that I just read to you in the congressional record that I, that I came to the, the light. In other words, I was stunned. I cried. Mm. I mean, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. Someone in the United States Senate is saying that Hawaii was never acquired, could never be acquired by the joint resolution. And I thought about the logic. If the United States could acquire Hawaii by joint resolution, Hawaii, by a legislative act, could acquire the United States. <laughs> it was so simple then. Yeah. Um, we've been led to believe that the emperor has clothes when he doesn't have clothes. And we've all been taught this legal falsehood. And we've all been led to believe it and led to believe that our lives depend upon this jurisdiction and everything we've gotten is by the benefit of the grace of the United States. You know, the attorneys coming out of UH now, the School of Law, uh, are they listening to what you have to say and will they apply it? Well, that's gonna be a a process because the first time in public since 20 years ago that I presented this was April 17th of 2014. Um, that was in the law school. Uh, people listen. They have the skills and logic to realize this. It was taught in a class. But they're working against a whole 120 years of bias and the fact that they've been promised a job under American law, which is going to pay them enough to be able to live in Hawaii. In short, there's Hawaiians who have and there's Hawaiians who have not. If you have, it's probably because of the American system. Those who have not, those without houses, those without money, those without medical insurance can see this more clearly because they don't have a stake in the myth that the United States has power and it's set it up in Hawaii so that they can succeed. They're very, it's a very privileged group who have become lawyers, who've become doctors. They can afford housing in Hawaii. But it's coming to the point where even as a lawyer, you're possibly not gonna be able to afford housing. You're possibly gonna have children who can't get jobs in their specialized areas. Hawaii is becoming unlivable and the message to everyone in Hawaii is, it's becoming unlivable, what are we gonna do about it? One of the alternatives lies here and with you, which is to entertain uh, a different form of government. One that could have the power to limit immigration, to limit the ability of foreigners to buy condos and houses. Um, to apply international law to shipping so that we're not held hostage by one or two carriers if we were an independent nation. Now, with um, you know the, the things that you have done along with Dr. Sai has done and going to the international community with Switzerland and now we, we've got this, uh, this article regarding China coming in. Um, how quickly do you see things changing? 
Uh, I've asked myself that, and what I would like to see is the learning continue. I would like to see us study other liberation movements, other governments that, like the Scotland uh, uh, plebiscite. I would see. I would say I'm a. I'm a little cautious. I, I don't say five years, I don't say 10 years. Um, I think the education is starting, but we need to learn a lot more, know a lot, a lot more about what form of government we want, and it will take more than 10 years. How do people do that? I mean, to learn all this stuff, what we aside do, from going to the University of Hawaii. No, what we do is we get the monies that are generated by the ceded lands. We create something called the Hawaiian Authority, like the Palestinian Authority that existed before the Palestinian state. And we just do it. We set up a court system. We set up a legislature. We set up an executive branch. Even if they don't have power under the American system, we have people who are judges and justices of the, uh, this court. People can bring their cases there, as well as in the American system, and we, we would act as if we were a court and pronounced judgments, they could take it over and show the judge. Say, look, look what I look what the Hawaiian Supreme Court of the Kingdom of Hawaii has said. We would have a legislature which would learn how to pass legislation, which would be able to critique the present laws of Hawaii and the United States. In other words, what we need is a government in waiting. And what we need is to begin to prepare the people for the, uh, the task of government. People are, are asking, what should we do at this convention? Um, I say, no matter what options you, you con you're considering, you need to have a government in waiting to step right in when the critical moment comes. You know, we have a lot of people, I mean, uh, Joe Kelleha on the streets that is busy with working, busy providing for the families, and now uh, this whole uh, government is about to just change. What's your advice? Uh, my advice to Joe K. Aloha is to take part. Become, uh, run for office in this new kingdom of Hawaii as a legislator. Um, bring your, your legal cases to the Hawaii court, even if it's a traffic violation, which you might be convicted in Hawaii court, uh, Hawaii state court, but get the Hawaii court to lay down the rules like we've seen and say there's no jurisdiction. Let the Hawaii judges see what is produced by people with knowledge. And if they're going to rule the same way, they probably will do it in the first couple cases. But they have to start thinking about what their obligation is to the United States Constitution itself and the rule of law and the whole idea of justice. Uh, the Waitangi Tribunal in New Zealand started out as an advisory tribunal. But as it produced more and more well-reasoned, logical decisions that were favored na native rights, it became a court that had power. I'm not suggesting that we just wait and see whether or not they give us power. But I'm saying that we are just beginning. We need to start training the people who will be uh, in the branches of government that we're going to establish. We don't want to see failure. We want to see. We need the time to develop the resources. Where can the money come from for the study of all the other countries who have passed through, like Palestine became a state, have passed through these phases? Um, the money can come from Ali'i trusts, it can come from the federal government, and it can come from the ceded lands revenue. You know, I, I, I think, you know, for the, for the future of the Hawaiian Kingdom, as well as, you know, our immediate future, uh, a lot of us are turning to guys like you at the university level and at uh, senior positions that will be able to uh, educate and influence people that are coming out of there. And I'm just, you know, really, really happy 
that we have uh, a person like you at the law school, Dr. Ken Osai, Willie Kawai, and everyone else that uh, is there that are educating people and looking for the fruits of your labors. Well, thank you. Um, I think there's a place for everyone. I really give a lot of credit to Dr. Sai. He was like out there in the wilderness without people really helping him for a long time, and he stuck with it. He made many critical moves. He presented us with the framework. Um, we're like the first generation. We need a second generation to start you know, fulfilling the prophecies, of the return of the kingdom of Hawaii, the, res the resurrection of the kingdom of Hawaii. Um, they have to turn and see that it's a possibility and want to be part of that government. Okay, we have uh, two minutes left. Oh. And so, uh, final thoughts. Uh, the final thoughts are that with what's coming up now, namely the move towards um, this convention, there, there seems to be a lot of lack of planning or ideas. There seems to be just two models, one model federal recognition, the other about the continuity of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And I'm saying that the common ground for them and us is a government in waiting. I'm not saying I'm supporting federal recognition, but I'm saying what we can agree upon is that we're going to need courts, whether you're going to be tribal or kingdom. We're going to need a legislature, whether you go tribal or kingdom. I think that the law is clear um, uh, in terms of that you don't go kingdom, excuse me, you don't go <laughs> tribal because the United States has no jurisdiction over it. But I've got to pay attention to the way, you know, the Hawaiians are divided. I'm saying, okay, it's only been a year. We don't have to decide that among ourselves immediately. But we, we do need the, to start training the young people, the next generation, who is going to govern. So let's put our common interest into sending Hawaiian students like our ancestors did, out to schooling in various parts, out to investigate uh, the liberation and independence movements in East Timor, Lithuania, what's going on there in Latvia and, Lithu and La um, Estonia. We need to know more about the world and how things have happened. Um, so far, what I'm admitting is I stumbled across this. <laughs> uh, we can't let we can't leave it at that. We're not going to stumble anymore. We're going to have a plan. Well, we're not going to leave it at that because, you know, we know that you're going to be coming up with uh, the document that you're working on and looking forward to it. I really would like to thank you for joining me tonight on Kanaka Express. Well, and, my pleasure. And I look forward to having Mahalo. you uh, more on Kanaka Express. And we appreciate all of you out there for joining us tonight. And again, a big mahalo to Dr. Williamson Chang from the School of Law. And we look forward to seeing you on the next show. Aloha. Well, how did that go? It went well. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. Okay. That went well. That went well. No, I, I'm looking forward to uh, what comes out of these. Yeah. What comes out of this? I haven't read them all yet. You know, it's like um, one day we'll have like a hundred me's <laughs> doing all of this stuff. Yeah. Then I gotta. I'll talk to Dexter and Keanu, yeah. You know about my case and see, you know how they want to work it because for you to. Uh, be a witness and retain as a consultant. Is that a conflict? Would that be a problem? No, I did it for Kali England. Okay. Um, that's not a conflict. Um, no, I consider it a public service. Okay. Okay, that'll be great. Uh, let me let me talk to them because 
there's supposed to be a um, um, conference with the judge uh, March 8th. That's coming up. Okay. Well, here's the thing that happened with Colleen England was the judge wouldn't let me speak. That may happen. Um, so, well, this we should put these ideas in the brief to the judge. You know, the, okay. So that if it ever goes up on appeal, it's, it's there even if I don't get to speak. Okay. Okay. I'll talk to, uh, to Dexter about So I'll help Dexter write a motion based on this, motion to dismiss. And that's good because it's written. It's we're not waiting for me to speak. Okay. So the key is uh, put it in front of their face. See, right now they 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 meet just just uh, pushing this aside. They're not even reading. Yeah, no. Because if they read what Keanu writes, uh, some of them admit, you know, they they do admit uh, mm -hmm. if they look cl closely. Um, if they read what I'm saying. They actually read and, and are give it a, a fair shake. They got to be convinced too. I mean, you're not an easy guy. I mean, if it wasn't clear, you wouldn't have been persuaded to go with it. I mean, we're not just magicians pulling the wool in people's eyes. We have facts. No, it, you know, and, and for me, it was just. These are, these are the facts. Yeah. So this is the truth. Well, then we should win. <laughs> Let's well, go with it. But knowing what the judges are doing, you know, and saying, I'm the judge, I have the power, regardless of the evidence that you submit. But, okay. You should win, but look how long it took to overturn slavery. That's right. And judges have to enforce this law where you return the fugitive slave to his owner. But we began to get judges who invented ways in which they, they didn't have to enforce those laws. In other words, you got to get to the conscience of the court. Yeah. So judges will start doing that. They'll start saying, oh, Mr. Gumukak, I'm going to let you off this time. <laughs> and you go, well, thank you. <laughs> because he can't admit. He may draw you into chambers and say secretly. Oh.